we are all welcome uh, for today's session. Uh, it's going to be an interactive one, I believe so. Um, this is one of the key topics that we have in the CC exam, and it's practical, and it's something that uh, you can start implementing even after the program. Um, access control is something that we need to understand properly, not only because we want to pass exam, because uh, you can read uh, DOMS and some other things and pass some exams, but it's more around you putting what we have learned into practice. So we need to have understanding of what is access control, the concept behind it, uh, the physical access control, we have the logical one, and also we have the administrative uh, access control as well. So let's dive into it. Uh, the overview, uh, what this aspect is just talking about, uh, is just a breakdown and the objectives of this particular chapter, how to select uh, access control that are appropriate in, given, in a given scenario. Uh, how do you know the right control to implement in an environment? Because sometimes when you are talking about security, you don't need to put too much of security on what is not necessary, what is not important. So the just like in Nigeria, I'm sorry for people that are not uh, uh, from Nigeria, uh, you can see when you have a president and you have a governor, you have a, a local a local local government and council chairman or thereabout. The security that will be assigned to the president will be more than the local council chairman. Why? Just because of the value, just because of the worth of that person. Mm. The same thing that is also applicable in an environment. There is no point putting too much security on what is not and leave uh, a high risk asset mm. unprotected. So when people are making decisions, you also need to do proper evaluation. Why are we doing this? Not that because uh, other company did this, this one did that. So it's important we have that understanding. Then how to relate the access control to process is important. And then uh, we'll later consider the various physical and logical control. Um, um, this year is too, nothing much here. It's just uh, talking about, uh, when you are talking about access control concept, is uh, you need to we'll be saying something al around roles and permission. Then there's something we call privilege access management. Privilege means like elevated access. You are not having a regular user access. There's something that is regular, which like you use for your day-to-day -day activity. So that is a regular access, which everybody can have. But when it comes to privilege, that means you there is a particular tax you execute. It might be once in a while. Uh, it might be when there is need for it, you have it. So that is one that is one of the reasons why people request for this kind of a thing. And privilege access require proper monitoring, They're able to see what is being done and who was the access given to. So you see the reason why I'm talking about this as we pro uh, progress with this course. Then uh, understanding the concept now, um, uh, this one not really much, I think. Uh, okay, let me just- In the last module, this. we covered all the planning that goes into incident response and disaster recovery. But how do security professionals protect information from falling into the wrong hands in the first place? That's the topic of our next module. Information security professionals are like gatekeepers, controlling who gets access to which systems and data, why they get certain permissions or not, and how. Let's find out more about these access control concepts. So you can hear in that place, um, uh, it was mentioned that the security professionals, they are gatekeepers. Who has what, what level, and what can you do with what has been assigned to you? So security control is a safeguard and also a countermeasure uh, to preserve our CID. 
CIA, sorry, which is the confidentiality, the integrity, and the availability of data. Another uh, program, we refer to it as CIA tried. So let's take note of that. These are the base, uh, basic and uh, security concept. What are you protecting? Why are you protecting it? Because that thing is confidential. Just that like when you are sending a letter out, you envelope it and you do a whole lot of things around it. Integrity of it and also the availability of that uh, information. So the reason why we have access control is to be able to limit what object can be available to what subject. Take note of that because we are going to see questions around that. Object is what you want to assess. Why the subject is who want to assess that particular resource. So uh, we'll further define the object and subject and rules later in this uh, chapter. So let's take note. one brief example of control is also a firewall, um, which is included in a system or the network to prevent something from outside from coming coming in and disturbing or compromising the environment is also one of the controls, technical controls that we have in organization being deployed. Sometimes you want to access a particular site. It will tell you that the page cannot be reached. Maybe you have seen it before. It's because the <laughs> firewall has been deployed and they've blocked certain uh, um, people from, you know, possibly connecting into the internet to do a lot of things, except there is a business justification for it. So people should not just get to an environment and have access to everything. So you might have business justification. If you get into an environment today and being a new staff, you have to fill the form uh, and state what and what and what you want, and then uh, you put justification for it. Then it will go through different level of approval. The technical, the, you know, somebody in your team approving it, head of department approving it. It will go to compliance, they will review it, and before to now get to the people that will implement it. So all these are very important. They are what we refer to as security control. We want to ensure that the system is secured. I also want to ensure that the people you are granting access to, they will not have more than what they need to do their job. Um, okay, I mentioned the other time about the subject and object. So here we have the definition. Uh, I think there is a point here. Say so it can be argued access control at the heart of information security program. Okay, let me also cite an example here. I remember one of the banks I work in Nigeria. Um, the access, uh, what do you call it? Use as as is it use access control or or the, uh, more like security governance control unit that in charge of user access management. Yeah, formally under internal control, they move from internal control to compliance. And at the end of the day, they move it from compliance to security. So the reason is not far fetched from this because it's the art of an information security program. So it has the gateway to everything within the organization. So it has to sit in information security, but different organizations can decide to put it anywhere they like. So, but the most important thing is that anywhere they have, the, the what they are doing just to ensure that we have security around whatever we do, especially for the people we are granting access to, who can get access to organizational assets. Is it the building? Is it the data? Is it the system? These are the things they will be working on and they will review uh, whatever level of access you need to get your job done. You shouldn't have more than what you need to do your job. Uh, so the subject, uh, just like we mentioned, can be defined as entering entity. It's an entity that requests access to our assets. Subject is requesting access to an asset. If you go to an ATM point and you insert your card, you put your PIN and information will go. At that point in time, you are the one making the request into the organizing the bank asset. <clears throat> Maybe I don't know the application they use. Uh, but they have all these different type of payment uh, uh, application. That application itself that we authenticate to, authenticate the card, that is the object you are trying to access. So you that you are accessing the object, you are the subject. 
and what we are trying to access is the object. So the entity requesting access may be a user and also a client can also be a process, can as well be a program. Please take note of this. Also as well, you know, uh, when you input your card, when you, sorry, when you insert your card and you put your pin, uh, then it will start asking you some information, uh, what is the name has to be asking you, uh, what kind of entire do you want to carry out? Is it cash withdrawal? Is it, um, what do you call it, a change pin? Uh, balance inquiry at that point in time the system that is prompting you now requesting for that information is now the subject you are the object passing the information across so it depends on the way so the question can come in different uh, way but just know that the entity that requests access to an asset is the subject it might be user it might also be a process it might as well be a program why you that you are supplying whatever is supplying the information back will be the object. So a subject is the initiator of a request for service. Simple. Is the initiator and is always referred to as active. It can be a user, is active because it initiates a request for access to, re to resources or services, and uh, request request a service from an object. So it's requesting and also should have a level of clearance permission that relates to its ability to successfully access that uh, resource as well. But let's just take, I think the simple way to, to actually grab this, that the subject is the initiator of the request. Yeah, so let's take note of that. Then if you go to the other one, which is the object, uh, the object is a device, can be a process, can as well be person or user or program or server or other entity that responds to a request for service. So where you are getting your response from, that is the object. So it depends. That like I told you that when the machine is asking you to select the option you want on the ATM, at that point in time, you are the object. Because the, the system is the one, maybe the server or the procedure or whatever, I don't know the application they might be using, prompting you to select the option you want. So the, 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 the requester or the initiator is the subject and the person responding or the device responding or the program responding is the object. Objects do not contain their own access control. Objects are passive and not active in access control times. You know, we said that subject is active because the one initiating a request. At the point that the subject was, you know, that, at, at the point that subject is initiating, the object is passive, just waiting, relaxing to get uh, the instruction on what to what to do. So that will help us when you have a questions. Uh, you have questions around that. Um, what else again? Then the rules, what rule is talking about uh, is, uh, is an instruction developed to allow or deny. So there is an instruction in between. See rules are something in between the subject and the object. Compare multiple att attributes to determine appropriate access. That is the one in between align access to an object, between subjects, in between, setting a rule. Okay, deny. For people that are in uh, IT feed, you know the firewall, there's a common thing this year, and no access list control that will determine that you allow or the deny. So there is a rule in between. So it depends on the way they will frame the question. For the fact that you're asking the question that they are mentioning object, they mention, they might, we might have the same question, but what they are going to ask you will determine the kind of answer you are going to give. So it depends on the angle at which they are coming from. The emphasis might be on the object, not the subject. And at times, the emphasis might be on the subject and not the object. And at times, the emphasis might be on the rules in between. So you have to read the question very well. A rule might be added to allow access from inside network to the other, so they are just a story and story. So, but the most important thing is that a rule will contain, contain or reference a set of attributes 
that divine what level of access has been determined to be appropriate. That must be have been set. You can see it in this place. Uh, divine how much access is allowed. Deny access to an object. Also, you can also have a rule that also set the time, apply time-based access. That is something that is common now with privileged access because of the criticality of that rule. We have what we call GIT, which is just in time access. Nobody will give you access. When you are carrying out a particular tax that is critical, there will always be a timeline to it. They won't give you and you go and sleep. Maybe tomorrow I will use it. It will expire. Because I said they will have set a restriction on it that this thing should be active within two hours. Once you fail to use it, you can never log in again because it's time-based. And also, it's also resource-based as well because it's not all everything you can have access to. When you are logging for such request, you will indicate the time you want to use it. You as well also, as you can see the hours you want to use it. Then you also indicate which particular application is going to affect one or two applications I'm using. So they will only give you access to the two applications. They won't, they won't, it's not an open check where you have access to everything. So that's, so this are where the issue of rules comes in between the subject and the object. So the rules will take care of that uh, restriction, either there is permission or uh, access to do what you want to do. Then here we have a control and risk. So let's see what is the difference between the two. A control serves to reduce the risk to where it is within the risk tolerance of the individual or organization. A physical control would be a seatbelt. An administrative control would be a law requiring the use of the seatbelt. Both of these serve to reduce the risk of driving to a degree that is acceptable to the driver and to society. Another non-technical example is that of a tall bookshelf. Since there is a risk of a tall bookshelf toppling over and possibly hurting someone, many local building codes or regulations require bookshelves to be secured to a wall using a strap or a bracket. In this case, the risk is the injury to people. A logical control is the building code and the actual attachment of the shelf to the wall is the physical control. Both logical and physical controls work together to mitigate the risk. So what that is just telling us is when you are mitigating a risk, then you need to bring in control. And there is also a key aspect of that, uh, which I will mention later. The, the uh, cost of control you are bringing on board to mitigate a risk should not be higher than the cost of the risk itself. There's also some of the skills that we need to have. We can have a risk of 20,000 20, pounds, or let's say 2,000 pounds, and the cost of mitigating it is now 5,000 pounds. It doesn't make any business sense to any to anybody. So whatever you are actually adopting or you are deploying to mitigate uh, the control, the cost of it should always be either equal to or less, mostly it's usually less than the cost of the risk itself. If it's higher than it, it's better to just accept the risk. So at least you have some money to save than for you to just be wasting money. So that what that um, video clip is just talking about is the laws that we have in place when you are driving, they are like administrative controls. Even the manual you also have in, in, in that comes with the event, so so administrative control as well, because we tell you what and what and what you need to put in place to avoid accidents and some other things. Then um the fiscal control they're just like you mentioned is the seat bed, and which is meant for you. So that's very important. So control assessment now. Re uh, reduction depends on the effectiveness of the control and that it must apply to the current situation and adapt to a changing environment. Uh, what this one is just talking about is uh, control um, is to reduce the risk and the effectiveness of, of, of it depends on how that control is implemented. We have various scenarios here. 
when you have a part of a building is being uh, repurposed for use as secure storage facility. Maybe initially that building was not made for that purpose, so they can just put any outdoor into it. But due to the privilege of the area, there are five doors <clears throat> which may be secured before confidential files can be stored there. Now they want to now use it for a different purpose entirely. Then they, are, they will need to fortify the environment. So when securing a physical location, there are several things to consider to keep the information the most secure. And it might be recommended to install biometric scanners on all the doors. Maybe then it was just ordinary wooden door or something like that. So that shows that when you are assessing an environment for control, we need to the the the, the worth of the asset itself will determine uh, the kind of control that you put uh, in place. Just like you go to a, a, a company or a banking environment, when you go to the data center, the kind of control that we have around the data center is actually different from what you have in the normal office space. So that's uh, important. So the cost of implementing the control must, it must align with the value of what is being protected. Must always align. So if multiple doors secure by secure, if multiple doors secure by biometric laws are not necessary, then the access to the area does not need to be audited. Perhaps a simple deadbolt lock on all the doors will provide a correct level of uh, control. Even when you are doing your audits, for many of us that we are into audit and the rest, when you are doing your audits, you also need to look at the where you where the highest risk is. You can't start doing an audit and be looking at uh, what is not. You have to know that also when you when there is an external body coming to audit, IT is always in, a, you know an area to focus on. They look at IT, they look at your compliance. They will not want to start auditing now, and they will not be facing the marketers. Well, what are they going to? What there is nothing to. No, I will know awareness and some other things too. It's also important when it comes to the marketing part of it. But the most important thing is the IT environment. So they will look at, they will have to sit down and look at the scope. And they will now have, okay, let's now look at how do we prioritize what we want to do. We only have one week here to stay. You see them focusing more around security, IT, uh, compliance, and the rest. So that is assessment of our control, putting it where it matters. Then there is something we call defense in depth as well. You are going to see this uh, security concept virtually in all the IT related courses that we might be going through, which means layer defense. What does it mean? We have a diagram here. What is saying that, okay, I have an asset, I have my asset here, and I'm putting controls around it. Administrative control is there, like something like a policy, um, SOP, guiding people on what to do and the rest, standards, procedure, they fall around here. Then I also have what you call logical or technical control. So you can see a question where they will mention logical control. They can as well mention technical control in order to why the physical control is physical, uh, which is just like an example we cited before. So defense in depth describes information security strategy that integrates people, technology, operation capability to establish variable barriers across multiple layers and missions of the organization. That means if one control fail, another one should mitigate it. So there are some environment like that whereby you have to put a whole lot of, you want to log into an application, to log into a system, gone are the days where you just only use a username and password. Then now you have to use MFA as well. So that's part of it. Make sure that we have layers of controls, layers of defense to prevent any form of a security breach. So defense in depth should be implemented to prevent and deter a cyber attack, but it cannot guarantee that an attack will not occur because we human beings, we are also the weakest link in the environment. The same person that have been profiled and you've been told you've actually gone through several trainings uh, around the security and the rest. They will say, 
give a colleague both the username and the password and even the token said because i want to go and eat so please let me verify the transaction so when anything happens the person will start oh i i wasn't i was i wasn't on seat somebody assisted me and nobody will, will listen to that because you'll be held accountable for anything that happens so the reason why we have all those mfa in place is because of okay if one fail or somebody has hacked your system to get your password what happened with your token so that is important so technical example of defense in which uh, multiple layers of technical control are implemented is when the user and password are required for logging into your account and followed by a code sent to your phone to verify your identity this is a form of multi-factor authentication using method on two layers something you have and something you know something you have is your token with you and something you know is your password why something you are as in you as a person that is the biometric part of it now so all these things they are being considered because of things that we have uh, happening these days so that is the meaning of defense uh, defense in depth that was a concept uh, around that uh, having multiple technical layers then um I think there is something here uh, that of interest. It, uh, okay, for a non-technical example, consider the multiple layers of access required to get to actual data in the data center. First, a lock on the door provides a physical barrier to access the data, while the second one is a technical access rule preventing access to that data center. Most time, if you are entering a data center, it will just, you, you can't see a data center, it just be lock and key. You just put a key and enter, no. You have to use biometrics. And what is it going to do? It will also capture your data. It will also, there are some that it will also have your, your footage as well. So if anything happens, they will know one who actually uh, access this facility at every point in time. So finally, policy or administrative control defines the rules that assign access to authorized uh, individual. And that's why after this asset, the next thing that follows is administrative control. Because that actually will drive every other thing in this uh, defense uh, layer concept. Uh, then um, defense in depth uh, practice is this, I uh, don't know. A data center might have multiple layers of defense. We would have administrative controls such as policies and procedures. Then logical or technical controls, which include programming to limit access. There are also physical controls, which we sometimes forget about in our highly technical world. Regardless of how much we focus on cloud computing and virtualization, there is always a physical location where information is being stored or processed in a physical hard drive in a physical computer. Even in a data center in a large organization that provides cloud computing services, for example, there is still a physical aspect of information storage and processing. So I know many of us would love to be in that kind of environment. Uh, that is this, just telling us the importance of the technical control, uh, administrative control, and as well as just like um, you want, if you have anything to do in an environment, you also need to fill a form. You need to make a request. That is a part of administrative control. It's not technical. It's just a common sense that you fill a form so that you can be permitted. Yeah, there are some offices you go to if you are not, if they are not expecting you to be in that place at that particular time, nobody will grant you access because you did not comply with the rules and regulations. So that is very important uh, to take note. They all work together. It, one, just one control is not enough. Sometimes we need to use uh, both the technical, administrative, and everything together to get the best. So you're combining all the controls together. So now we are looking at um, principle of least privilege. Least privilege, what it means is having the minimum access you need to get your job done. The least, just like when you are looking at a uh, computer where you have a read only, read and write only, there are some CD where you can only play the music, you cannot write on it. We have some CD that you can write on it, you can play and the rest. So see that some the least 
you know, giving you the least assets that you need that will not cause any problem into the environment. So that is what it means. It's a standard of permitting only minimum assets necessary for users. And they implement this mostly for regular users, what everybody is doing every day. You know, we fall under this category to fulfill their function, their normal function, daily function. Users have provided access to only to the systems and programs they need to perform their specific job or task. Uh, for many of us, maybe people that are familiar, many of, many of us that we are in UK here, yeah, that you have been to one university or the other year, yeah. you know, they also have, when you are working, when you are assessing their resources from home, that some of them, they have like a Citric application that you need to log into the Citric to actually have access to the environment. That is another layer entirely. Different from the usual one that you are using at home because you are, you are connecting remotely to their environment. So having the minimum, and not everything you can do, when you get to that environment, it's only take you to what and what you want to do. There is another layer entirely that's meant for people that, that will be supporting the application, resolving issues and the rest, which you might not even see at all on your, on your own console. You won't see it. So that is the way we should see it. Having the list, the minimum assets that you need. So we can just... I appreciate this. Gabrielle is a recent new hire at Jobson. She reaches out to me for help. Hey, Nate. Yeah. I accidentally submitted my time card already, and I can't get into the panel system to fix that. Well, of course you can't get into the system. Only the manager, that's me, can get into the system. Otherwise, you'd have employees giving themselves raises and having access to confidential employee information. Here, let me show you. Okay. So I think you appreciate that. So you can see in that place, the lady was trying to assess a particular resource on the laptop and she could not just because she was not permitted to. Maybe she can just do ordinary checking emails and the rest. But as on certain tasks, you will not be able to carry out because you are not granted access to that environment. So I, I also, you can also appreciate what the guy was doing. Even when he was about typing his password, he, he looked at the lady again. Either the lady was doing a, a shoulder serving or the rest, trying to look at the password. And you also the same thing. You must be conscious of the environment as well. Whatever you are doing, you have to be conscious of the environment. So then the example of the least privilege, we have many of them here. Yeah. Uh, for example, only individual working in a billing will be allowed to view customer financial data. And even fewer individuals will have the authority to change or delete the data. The least privilege is meant for everybody. But when you learn there are other tasks need to be carried out and your, your profile or your assets need to be elevated, you don't give that kind of a right to everybody. There are some tasks like that that they only give you to the head of the department because they have to match it with your role that, okay, if anything happens, we can hold you accountable. So this maintain confidentiality, integrity, while also allowing availability by providing administrative access with an appropriate password or sign on that proves the user has the appropriate permission to assess the data. So. These are giving you exactly what you need, not excessive rights or toxic rights. Sometimes it's necessary to allow user to access information via a temporary or limited access, for instance, for a specific time period or just within normal business hours. There are some transactions like that. You can only carry out uh, carry such transactions out during the business working hour, not once it's past five or past six the platform will not be available again. So also our next, next sector too, they also made an example that there are some medical records that only the doctor can have access to it. Not everybody can have access to your medical. No, I'm okay, the normal patient data where everybody can see, but not their medical data. Individual doctors too might also have access only to data related to their own patients, not every other one. Mm -mm. If you come in the morning and they assign five patients to you to attend to, you only have access to the record of the five. 
you can't check another people's uh, record. There are so many where people will be working in a place and somebody will be calling you. Can, can you please let me check my, my wife's imbalance? And uh, you'll be checking it just because you are working in the environment. That's a misuse of rights. You are misusing the privilege given to you. So sometimes when we have understanding of all these things, just tell the person that, please, I can't do that. So this is regulated by law and the rest. So then um, the more critical, okay, now system open monitor access to private information. If logs indicate that someone has attempted to access a database without the proper permission, that will automatically trigger an alarm. There are some environments like that. When you are given an access to do something or to, to carry out a particular task, yes, if you are within that environment doing what you are meant to do, no problem. But the moment you, you move beyond that level, or you even ordinarily clicking on a, a folder where you ought not to click, maybe you have like three, four folders in it, and you say, okay, I'm working on this particular thing, and you're not going to another environment entirely, it will deny you access. And not only that alone, it's going to send notification. It will trigger an alert to other security and some other people. So they are not there with you, but they, through the system, that is technical control. Through the system, they can see what you are doing. Somebody will just walk up to you and say, Mr. Man, what are you trying to do? Because I receive an alert or notification that you are making an attempt to do so, so, so. So when people are also conscious of that, they, it will stop them. That's a deterrent control, stopping people from doing it because you know you're also being monitored when you do such. And I also mentioned it here last week that that's in that kind of environment too, when you are also carrying out your task, it will also it will be recording what you are doing. Like somebody video that will just you know take a you know, like a complete video of what you are doing right from beginning to the end. And they will go back there and review it. Why, why, did, why, did, why did you do this? You cannot deny it. You did not, you did not make that attempt because everything has been captured. So when you are working in an environment like that, we just have to be very careful and play by the rules. Just do what you are meant to do. Um, the more critical information a person has to, the greater the security should be around the, the access. And they should definitely have a multi-factor authentication, for instance. Uh, that's that. So this is the second one of the uh, enhanced uh, uh, role or access level that we talked about. We call it privilege access management. And what this one talking about is provide the first and perhaps most familiar use case. A woman user identified ident identity that is granted various create, read, update, delete, to do a whole lot of things. You have been, privileged me that you have been elevated. You are above every other person. So without this privilege access, the system access control would, would have those privileges assigned to the administrative user in a static way, effectively on the 24 hours a day or every day. So security will be dependent upon the login process to prevent misuse of that identity. Now, when you have a privileged access, you have, you have been elevated. You are like, you are promoted. You can do anything. You can delete. Just like we mentioned, you can create. You can create a user or known user to do all manner of things. So when you have that kind of access, you are being monitored closely. If I'm working in a place, Maybe uh, 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 you have some organization where both the identity and the uh, assets, they are together, privileged assets, identity assets, they are together in the same place. Yeah, I won't, if I'm to, uh, I'm to choose between the two, which one should I focus more attention on? When you are in an environment, the privileged assets is number one because they can carry out any form of transaction. The regular one is regular. I've given you what you need. When you try to move into another room, you'll be blocked because you are not permitted to move there. But for the privilege, they can go into any room. So my attention will be on somebody that can move into any environment. So what they normally do in that kind of environment is you provide them one that should be a proper approval in place when they are getting that kind of a access. Then also 
the, the assets must be restricted to the time they need in carrying it out, just in time privilege access management. You are getting it at the appropriate time when you need it. And by the time you are done, um, nobody is even waiting for you to either finish or not. System will take you out. It will knock you off completely. And most of all these uh, assets now, we have it being automated. It's not about uh, somebody monitoring you, what you are doing, what you are not doing. They are being automated so that like, once you get to the time limit, it will just take you out completely. And everything you have done, the audit log will show everything for people to review at the end of the day. Uh, there's a case study here. Yeah? Uh, we can, uh, ABC has a small IT department that is responsible for user provisioning as in creating of users um, and administering system. To save time, the IT department employees added their ID to the domain admin group, effectively giving them access to everything within the Windows server and the workstation environment. Not because they want to save time. While reviewing an invoice that was received via email, they opened an email that had a malicious attachment that initiated a ransomware attack. Since they are using domain admin privileges, the ransomware was able to encrypt all the files on all servers and the workstations. A player access management solution could limit the damage done by this ransomware if administrator privileges are only used when performing a function requiring that level of access. Routine operations such as daily emails are done without a high level of access. So what this one is saying is that when you are performing a critical task, you don't use a, a regular user account. For the daily routine task, yeah, you have it. If it's what everybody is doing every day, yeah, we give everybody the same thing. Then, but if this particular task you want to do is what you do once in a while, and you need the IR role to do it or IR permission to do it, then such person needs a different environment to do it if the organization can afford it. If you want to do some other tasks like that, but I, I, I know of an environment where you want to carry out some uh, patch management, uh, system upgrade, they have a dedicated system for that with administrative uh, account to do it. You don't use your normal laptops and whatever. They have a dedicated system to, for, for it. So that is because it's a privileged access that must be monitored and managed effectively. If anything should go wrong, it will affect the organization. So then the privileged account too, is now those kind of permission beyond those of normal users now. Access is just the access to resources, to what you can access and the rest. But now, Account is like what is taking you into that environment. The permission you have are those with permission beyond those of normal users, such as managers and administrators. All these are managers. Managers, they have you know, higher level to do because most of them, they are the ones verifying some powerful transactions address. For people who have also worked in the banking environment, there are some accounts. When you check the balance or you're trying to view it, you will not see that so, such an account. And the account exists. So because, because you are not permitted to, to view, even to even view it, you can't see it. So system administrator, help desk, security analyst, they have these elevated privileges. And uh, they, are, they use it in different, uh, to handle different kind of transactions. Like system administrator, operating the system, application deployments, Updex also supporting users, joining domain, removing from domain and the rest, so they need it. The security analyst too, the entire IT infrastructure to endpoints and environment. And so there are some other people like that that also have this kind of a role. So other case of project user account may be created on a per client or per project basis. You can see in that place, per client, where you need access to, and per project. When you are done with that project, your access is revoked. You don't have it for forever. That's why some people, when they resign today like this, that same day, they must, they must delete their profile or they must disable it immediately. 
because they can do, you know, even from outside, they can connect and do some other stuff. So that is that. The few examples indicate that organization often need to delegate capability to manage and protect this information asset to various managers and supervisory and the support and leadership uh, people with different different levels of authority and uh, responsibility. I've said it here, because of the importance of this elevated uh, right and the risk involved. So more expensive and detailed logging than regular user accounts. The record of privileged account is vitally important. And uh, as both a deterrent for privileged account, others that might be tempted to engage in on toward activity and administrative uh, control, the logs can be audited, reviewed to detect and respond to malicious. So such requests, you know, they have to actually ensure uh, the event, whatever you have carried out, is properly locked. It's properly locked and monitored and reviewed too. You do more a weekly review, daily review on all these things. And most times they have it automated so that you just get a trigger that will take you to the environment to go and you don't need to sit down. The most stringent uh, access control than regular user access. We have it on this uh, privileged access. They have a stringent access control, MFA, and not MFA upon MFA and the rest. So, and there are some, even after they've granted you access, by the time you are connecting, it will alert the administrator that you're about to connect. They will now enable you. Or they might even need to call you if you are not together in the same place. Are you the one connecting? I say, yes, they will grant you access to moving. And by the time you are done with your task, Based on the time they actually uh, allotted to you, it will take you out completely. That's why they say just in time identity should also be considered in a way to restrict the use of these privilege, privileges to specific tasks. Then another thing here is deeper trust verification than regular user account. Privilege account order should be should be subject to more detailed background checks. You can see in this place though. <laughs> This one is very important. When you are when you are when you are taking up a role, a whole lot of checks and checks will be done. Stricter non-disclosure agreements, acceptable use policies, and being willing to be subject to financial investigation. And you ask a lot of questions. They will even send me to where you have worked before. They are not asking them only if you have stolen money. No. They just want to know you are you the type that violates rules and regulation when they give you instruction on what to do you won't say you are using your own idea say I, my own method is faster let, let, let me adopt it you are doing something different from what has been written down lay down rules and regulation process and procedure why not follow the procedure and follow everything so when they are request when they are sending your um, reference form they are not asking only for uh, either you have stolen, either you are punctual to work, you know. They also want to know about your character. If you are the type that are just strictly to process and procedure. So all these things are very important. Um, then the last one is more auditing than regular user account. The regular user account because not too much risk around that. So they will have to audit it regularly. It should be monitored as well and audited at a greater rate and extent than regular uh, usage. Then this is another concept that we need to take note of, which is talking about segregation of duties. Is that you are breaking a, 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 you know, a tax into two. A single person not being able to finish a particular thing, a transaction end to end. There are some transactions like that. When you do, when you, when you are the one inputting it, someone else has to be the one verifying it. So this is what this one is talking about. It's a core element of authorization. You no, know, we have spoken about identity with your user ID and the rest, authorization, MFA, and the rest. And uh, this one is the authorization, uh, authorization part of it, where you are being restricted to be an inputter or you are a verifier, initiator, or somebody that we approve. So that was so said. You know, there are some tasks that has to be, you have just have to separate it, separation of duties. Is based on security practice that no one person should control an entire high risk transaction. 
from start from start to finish. Please, even when you are attending the interview, that you know when you are using some terms, you know it helps a lot too. When you are using all these terms, it's not because of the exam. I said it. You should be familiar with all these things. So when you are talking, people, you talk like a technical person. Say, oh, this person know what he or she is saying, even though you might not know some some other things. But at least this one you have known. You stick to it. So for an entire IRS transaction, a single person should not be able to start and finish it. That is what this part is talking about. Uh, we can take our time to just go through every other thing, but that's just a summary here. Then this test can prevent fraud or dictate an error in the process before implementation. So to stop, that I've mentioned about the process for seeking access, getting approval for some task. Somebody has to request, somebody will review without compliance, uh, will review it before to get to people that will implement it. Uh, then uh, it is possible, of course, that two individuals can willfully work together to bypass the segregation of duty so that they could jointly commit fraud. This is called collusion. We have it yet, on several people having issues coming together. Yeah, the inputer, the verifier, they will join together and they will uh, you know, form an alliance to defraud. So, and if anything happens, they will see pick the two of them up because there's something you are doing that is not being locked. So, you cannot smarter than the system. Everything has been done such a way that you will know who is doing what. Another implementation of this uh, section of duty is dual control. Uh, uh, this will apply at a bank where there are two separate combination locks on the door of a fault. Some person know one of the combination and another person or some know the other. So, but one person knows, but no person knows the two. That is it. And there are some might not be two, two separate combination locks. It might just be one is key, the other one is combination lock. So somebody has a key, Somebody knows uh, the code to the combination lock. So you will put you I input the code, you, you make use of the key and open it. So um, but people compromise that as well. You see someone that will tell you that I'm, I'm very busy. If you know that you are busy, if you know that you are sick, you don't be able to come to work. Why not make it official? Do the right thing, submit your key to your head or whatever. Officially, they will know that you are not at work. Not that you give them your key because you don't want them to know that you're not at work. You don't, you will still want to collect the salary for that day. If they should go and commit a fraud, it will be in trouble. Because you can't tell them that then you, you, because I was not there. So, okay, how come they use your key? You now be looking, you be able to defend yourself. Even though you are you are strong, why not go just go and leave? Let somebody else do the work. There's never we should not compromise this process. All these things they are just for our own good. Two people must work together to open the vault. Thus, the vault is under dual control because it involves two people. Then also we have two-person integrity as well, which is a security strategy that requires a minimum of two people to be in an area together, making it impossible for one person in the area alone. So it's also same, something similar to what we have been discussing. It involves two people. Many access control systems prevent an individual card order from entering a selected high security area unless accompanied by at least one other person. Use of the two-person rule can help reduce insider threats to critical area by requiring at least two individuals to be present at any time. So all these things, they are a security concept that's actually helping in mitigating fraud uh, error and uh, some other things. Then we have what you call authorized versus unauthorized personnel. When you have a card, an access card, uh, your ID card has been profiled to access an environment. That means you have been authorized. And the moment a person presents that ID card to the data center door, the system checks the ID number and compares it to the security matrix within the system, looking at your role. Because they will have also set a permission that this person is allowed to access this environment. That is why there are some companies 
when you go in as a visitor, they will restrict you to the floor that you have business with. You can't get to floor eight. You have told them that you are going to uh, floor whatever. And, and before you know it, you are you want to assess nine. You won't be able to do that because they have to restrict you to the particular place you are going to. So that is the authorized now, authorized and authorized personnel. So, and that is auto driven using your car, your card. So let's take note of that. Uh, then, um, how users are provisioned. Now, this one is important. How you are provisioned. A new user, when you get into a, a, an environment, when you are hired, the hiring manager sends a request to the security and so to create a new user ID for you. You have an ID. If you are an, an old staff and you are coming back again, sometimes they might allow you to use the existing one because they might not want to start creating two different ID for the same name because your name might not change. They said they want to alter your name or alter your email address and the rest. So this request authorizes creation of new ID and provides instruction on appropriate access level. Just like we mentioned, a least privilege. You know, having the least privileged access. Then additional authorization may be required by company policy for elevated permission. But the first one you are going to get is the list when you are coming in for the first time. You are in already. If that's okay, or based on your role, you are the manager, you are this, you are that. Okay, let's elevate this person's role. They can now elevate it. So you are getting access based on your role. But being a new staff, you'll be provisioned. User provisioning. That means you are creating the user. You know, adding you, giving you the resources you need to have access to. Then, when there is a change of position, then you are being redeployed, either from IT to marketing. You can't carry the same role or the permission that you have to marketing. No, they will need to remove it. Some of the the permission that you have, they have to change the role completely. They have to give you another role. If the organization is where they have like a a Aruba, which is role based access. Then they will remove the initial role that you have because I know there are some organizations like that. When you get there's some certain level you get to, you, you have to push you to marketing, whether you like it or not. You can't stay there forever. So they have to actually remove some of the privileges that you have and they will update your assets appropriately. So any asset that is no longer needed in the new job will be removed. So that is that for a change of role. The Damaya also have a question around this where they will ask you that, okay, when there's somebody is changing his role, will they still maintain the same access? So at least you should be bold enough to know the right answer for this kind of questions. And if you're also moving from marketing to IT, definitely there might be need for your role to be elevated. So the separation of employment now, when someone resigned, what happened? They need to disable your profile is very important the last day of your employment your profile has to be disabled which is important we know that some environments where somebody will have resigned two years ago and they'll still have an active uh, profile so some of the ideas are not the thought these are the things that we should just little little, little things like somebody dropping the boat just little little control gaps little little uh, gap analysis you carry out and you come up with a report say, wow, this guy is a, a winch. We are not a winch. It's just because we are following the process. So it's important when somebody is leaving an organization, the, the, the assets that person has, the role and everything has to be removed. So that is that. Uh, I think that is a case study, yeah? Um, they said upon hiring or changing role, the, the, the best practice is not to copy is not is not to copy user profile to new user. When you hire, you know that the how, how would I put it? It's like you have a template. You want to use, you want to replicate, <laughs> that's the word. Replic replicating an existing user for the new user. Is sometimes is is actually risky because if the person you are replicating has a higher role or an elevated role, 
you are giving the new user that does not require such, you know, unrestricted access. And that's what they call a uh, permission or privilege uh, creep. And similar to what we have in project management, uh, scope and uh, creep. When some you have started the project, you have gotten the scope and the uh, client is telling you, please, can you add uh, uh, this one to it as well? No, that is scope, scope creep. It's not part of the original design or agreement. So privilege crypto can exist when we are replicating an existing profile for a new a user, and we have to avoid that. So I think that what this one just talking about, if an employee is given additional access to complete a task, and that access is not removed when the task is completed, and then that user's profile is copied to create a new user ID. The new user ID is created with more permissions than are needed to complete their functions. It is recommended that standard rules are established and new users are created based on those standards rather than an actual user. You have a standard rule that for you to now copy and paste an existing user that has elevated rights for the new user. So, and the person, in fact, when the person start making mistake or uh, carry out some funny transactions, the person is not at fault because he or she might not know what you have given to them. So the problem will now be on who now provide this user. They will start tracing it, and if you should get to your table, they will ask you the question: Why did you do this? Sometimes job because you want to just want to quickly get the job done. You don't want to waste time. You just replicate. Sometimes it's risky to do that because of privilege. Uh, um, let's see this. Whether a user is authorized or unauthorized depends on their user provisioning, which is an identity management process for creating and managing access to resources and information systems. While we usually think of user provisioning as creating new accounts, there are several different situations which require action by a security administrator who is responsible for provisioning user accounts. In fact, Susan finds herself in a situation that requires changes to a user's provisioning. Let's check in with her as she notifies the security administrator of this change. Susan is talking to her security administrator. Hi, um, one of my employees is going to be taking a temporary leave of absence. Demetra, she's going to be taking a sabbatical from work and she's not going to need access to the systems. Since Demetra will not be accessing the systems, the security admin recommends disabling her accounts while she's not at work because this reduces the risk that her account could be used by an unauthorized person while she's on leave. He tells Susan to make the request. Then, according to the company policy and procedures, he will disable Demetra's login account. So she's not allowed to log into the company systems while out on leave. So will this make things complicated when Demetra does return to work? Oh, I see. So even though the account is disabled but not otherwise modified, it will be easy to reactivate it once she returns. Okay, that's great news because I'm going to need her up and running as soon as she gets back. So you can see in that place, when you return back from leave, before going, the last day, your assets will be disabled. And by the time you return back, they will need, they will need, you are not, they, there is no need to start profiling you on all the applications again. The only thing they will do is just to activate your assets on all the applications. And these days, we have some of it being automated. They once we resume, the HR we have already have an application that talks to other applications. So once the HR activates your profile that you have resumed, it will just, you know, like, uh, instructing other applications to enable your profile and you start working without any uh, service failure. So I think that's that. Um, okay, this activity on our own, we can just try and take a look at it, asking us which role will get regular account permission, which one uh, will help we get a regular account permission, either irregular or privileged. So you can go so I won't take time to go through it. If you miss it, you come back again and do it. I think you need to give you some of the answers. Um, here too, it's also some analysis. Just take your time just to practice what you have learned. Let's do that on our own. Um, then uh, the next one is this. 
I think in the next uh, by this is eight forty two, we should be true, hopefully by by nine. Control is a safeguard or countermeasure designed to preserve confidentiality, integrity, and availability of data. We also discuss defense in depth as an implementation of multiple technical controls. Now we will look at a scenario that uses multiple controls across the spectrum, including physical, technical, and administrative controls. Payroll is one area in nearly every organization that requires multiple levels of controls to ensure money is not mishandled. Most will agree that just a single control is too risky, so multiple controls are often implemented. To prevent payroll personnel from creating a fictional employee and processing a check for that employee, a logical or technical control is to ensure that a person who processes payroll is not able to create a new employee record and process the check print file. A physical control that helps reinforce that technical control is to ensure the actual paper media that checks are printed on is secured in a place that is not accessible to the person processing payroll. Both of these controls can further be enforced by creating an administrative control or policy that regularly audits the technical and physical controls by reviewing new employees added to the system and by logging and verifying the number on physical checks. Small and medium businesses have a particular challenge when it comes to technical controls, as they often do not have sufficient personnel to separate the duties within the payroll system. In this case, it may become necessary to implement only physical and logical controls that align with the business needs. So it's just similar to what we have said. We benefit of multiple control. Even there is a failure with one, the other one will serve as a compensating control. Uh, then understanding the physical control now, which is physical. Uh, let's dive into it. Uh, we'll just move very fast. What this one is just talking about is physical touch, physical mecha a mechanism deployed to prevent or monitor. Example. Uh, security guards, defense, monitor, detector. When you are in an environment and you are moving in, like a place, it's just to be on. I remember the first day I went to work in Abadi. You know, I was wondering, I said, where are all the securities in this place? Nobody is even there at the gate or whatever. You just get there, automatically the door opens. Bam. And before you know it, you're already there inside. Camera is there, monitoring what you are doing. So we don't really have time. It's when you move to an area they are not expecting you to go to. It's just that somebody, something will just trigger an alarm or something. So motion detector is also there as well. And um, uh, laptop locks, your badges, swipe card, cameras. Physical access controls are necessary to protect the asset of a company, including its important uh, asset, which is the people. Please take note of this. No one we are talking about a canon. So when you are, when you are in an environment and they ask you that, okay, the, the critical access in this environment is what? You'll be talking of a server, you'll be talking of a, an IT equipment. Human beings, number one. So they are saying physical access control and actually to protect the asset of the company, including its most important assets. So human being number, number one before any other thing. So when considering the physical control, the security of personnel always come first, followed by security, but uh, followed by securing other physical assets. Please, there are questions you will get around this. So they'll be comparing human beings with other things and the rest. I remember there was one who was saying out of all the tax, which one do you, do you think is important? They mention fire drill, they mention uh, having a backup center and some other things like that. Which is good when you have a backup, uh, what do you call it, alternate center, where if there's any failure at the primary site, it will fail over to the diet, which is good. But fire drill, uh, drill is, is also important because that is meant for human being. So you have to pay attention to those questions. Uh, human being is number one before any other thing. So this one is saying why a physical security control include fences. 
uh, barriers and the rest, you know, other features that prevent unauthorized individuals from entering a physical site, such as a workplace. And this is to protect, this is to protect not only physical assets, such as computer from being stolen, but also to protect the health and the safety of personnel inside the place. So please take note. So you can see that emphasis now. So I don't expect you to miss questions like that. And I just, maybe today, sir, yeah, I'll see what I can do to also send some of the questions I have down for us to start practicing. But you can also get some on uh, LinkedIn and the rest too. Okay, so this one is also the same thing what we have mentioned. Uh, with the physical, the use of physical access control and monitoring personal and equipment, entering and leaving as well as auditing, logging of physical events are primary elements in maintaining overall organizational security. So everything that happens there is being monitored, uh, logged, and the rest. So we have an alarm system in place. We have camera, which is also for monitoring. We also have a security guard as well. Uh, it's also effective physical security control. No matter what form of physical access control is used, the security guard is key as well. Then also have logs. Is a record of event that's of course. Physical security logs are essential to support business requirements and they should capture and retain information as long as necessary. Not a uh hand. -huh. You also get questions along this. Can you retain a user or customer data for forever? No. Even many of us that we uh, have a profile with one, or, you know, we profile ourselves or register one application or the other when we're looking for a job. After a year, they will get back to you. Do you still want us to retain your data or want us to delete it? They will still communicate to you. That is a structured environment. The other environment you will get to, they will not even ask you. They will be using your data to do all manner of things without your consent. So then the physical control, we have question here. Say which of these following is not a source, a source of biometric data. So which one is answer to this? C C badge. Badges. 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 Yes, yes, good. Fingerprinting. Good. Because this has to do with uh, woman features, biometrics, your iris scan, your voice print, voice print as well, too. So badges, the answer there. So just take notes. I think uh, nothing much, nothing much, nothing much, nothing much. Uh, when using physical access control token, how are the user credential read so they can be transmitted to a logic access control system? D, all of the above. All of the above. Mm -hmm. Good. So I think many of us, I think some of us have even been reading the material. So it's not something the our coming together is just to refresh and uh, learn one or two things. Let's go. I think I will stop uh with the last one. Then maybe Madam Timmy can also share one or two information with us on our experience that she has along this as well. So uh the terms, take note of the terms. Please take time to go through all these things. The question will not go beyond all this material, just that sometimes we are not pay attention to some scenarios, the thing they are giving to us. So let's take notes. What is mandatory? What is discretionary control? And the other one to the out back, not based control. So you just take notes of everything is not defined. Um, then uh, the flashcard too. Just uh, more like definition to some items. So you can just go, go through it as well if you help us. And then uh, we have more questions. So can I read through and the rest? I think uh, we should be fine. Okay. Any question? Um, sorry, how do I get access to this? Uh, this what you've just gone through. Material. Uh, yeah, I think uh, the first class, 
the first class, if you go to the YouTube, you um uh, you should be able to get a step by step uh, is detailed guide on that because okay. we actually took our time to take people through the registration. Okay, that's fine. I I'm, I I have the access to that yeah. now. Okay. I that class for I can say thank you. Thanks so much. Security is sweet. So I encourage everybody to start doing something, something, something valuable. The same people in the industry today. So, and it's not until when you are fully a technical person before you can work there. If it's GRC, you can focus on it, something. It's just for you to get familiar with all these things and some uh, at other programs that uh, Black and Sport has for us, uh, creating a lab environment after this. And it's a community that you need to also uh, uh, make sure you are not far from it. Always come back to learn more. We we'll discuss together. If you get a job today and having a challenge, somebody you can also give an idea of how to go about it. So that for you to get a job and say I've gotten a job and uh, move away from your community, that might not help. So thank you uh, for today. Back to you. Madam Timmy. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, seems nobody has got questions, but they are happy with the... Uh, I always enjoy sex control, I love it. And uh, we are so fortunate that the person that have just taken us through the, for, uh, the session is working in that area. And if you want to go into that domain in cybersecurity, you can be sure you have someone that knows his way around the topic and will be able to advise you. And he mentioned something that is also very key towards the end of the session that you don't really have to be technical, technical to get into cybersecurity. I always use myself as an example. Even though I have I've worked in IT all my life, at some point, <laughs> I thought it was a punishment when I was, uh, nobody wanted to work on a um, identity and access mo uh, management project. When I joined a contract, I was working on a contract with um, Standard Life. And um, my program manager came to me and said, Timmy, you have to help me here. Nobody wants to take up this uh, piece of work. And I asked him what it was about and he told me it was, uh, identity and access money. I said, I've never done it before. So please, you know, spare me. And he told me something that really, you know, made me to say, you know what, let me just give it a shot. He said, you never know what's the worst that can happen. The worst that can happen is you learn something from it. And that was what opened the door for me in cybersecurity. I wasn't even thinking of it. I was even thinking of pushing it away. But I put myself through it. I went on YouTube. I didn't. I did not even have the support system that you guys have now. I mean, we now have members and mentors at Black and Scott that you can come to to ask your questions. I did not have any. The only mentor I had was YouTube. I was combing you YouTube night and day, trying to understand the concept, trying to understand what I need to do because I was working as a technical business analyst what questions I need to ask, what I need to document, how I need to take through the processing, just to understand it. And here I am today. So please, if you don't have experience before, or you are keen to get into cybersecurity, you are in the right place. There are so many other domains that are not as technical, um, that uh, might be a, a worry to you. Just stick with us and we'll keep explaining and guiding you through the process. So thank you again for joining. We want more people. We want more Black people. Don't forget, we now have CSEC. We have ISC2. We have um, Cisco. We have ISME. We have the Scottish Government. We have Aberdeen City Council. Other yes. partners that I'm not going to mention now because I need to make sure they sign their paper, uh, the dotted lines. They are supporting what we are doing. And we want them to come for our conference in May. So please, 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 please don't miss all our sessions. We're going to start having networking sessions across Scotland, also in England, because some people in London are bothering me that 
we need to do something. So if yes. you are worried that we are not doing something physical, if you are in Aberdeen, I'm ready to you know organize some session. We have people in Aberdeen, in Glasgow and Edinburgh, and five, five is now on fire for Black and Bye -bye. They are ready to go. So if you are keen to network, 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 let us know and we can meet for uh, a networking session. Having said that, the Scottish government, like I said, has given us a contract to talk about cyber resilience to the black community in Scotland and to work with some organizations. So please, if we share something with yourselves, share with your friend how to be how to report all those scammers that ask you to uh, call, call them and give them a WhatsApp code. There is a number you can send uh, those you can report those number to 7726 just text that number to that code 7726 7726 just text the number the more people that report that number the more that people like that i mean scammers like that can be put in check we realize that a lot a lot of our people don't even know they can report uh, scammers they can report phishing attempts or things like that but you can and that is what the project is about, to teach you how to be cyber resilient, to teach you not to click, to teach you not to expect any form of money in your account if you are not expecting it, because people use that as, as bait. I, I still shared the last time that um, on the session that during our gala, somebody paid £2,000 into Black and Scott account, and I was not expecting it. Even though it would have been great, <laughs> but I know it's not my money. I know it's not Black and Scott's money. I reached out to the person that I thought it was. They did not answer. Then somebody else called me and said they made that transfer by mistake and asked me to send it back to them. And I said, unfortunately, as much as I would love to, I have to go through the right channel because I understand what scamming is. I understand what layering is. I not understand what money laundering is. Maybe mm. they were just trying to pull a fast one on me. So I've asked this person nicely and gently. I am not the only one that signs the blank uh, the bank accounts from for black and scott and i have to go to the right channel through my bank you go through your bank if your bank says they're going to investigate i'm fine your two thousand pounds is in my account you can come back for it whenever it's there i'm not going to touch it but do the right thing i have not heard back from this person for over a month wow 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 so these are wow. fantastic things you need to start being aware of i mean the money is there if they come back in as it's, it's still going to be there for the next 90 days because usually when banks have to, you know investigating it takes up to that having worked in the financial investment and banking session for a while i understand how these things work sometimes mm. it's called money laundering but people will not let you know it's money laundering you mm. just open it to your account but sometimes it's coming the wow. best money into your account from somebody's credit card, you they will now call you and say, please, can you, it was a mistake. Can you please send the money back? And because you trust them or you're being nice, hmm. you send the money back. That's 2,000 pounds from your account. I'm just using that 2,000 pounds as an example. So you would have sent the money back to the account and they have gone their way. For a couple of weeks later, a bank will contact you and say to you, Actually, somebody made a deposit from another person's account into your account. Mm. And that money was in there. So unfortunately, we have to collect that £2,000 back from you. So you have lost money because mm. somebody made the first one on you. It's a trick that is going out. People that are not aware will fall for that trick and they will be £2,000 short. Because... The person that paid money into your account has tricked you to collect £2,000 from you whilst they are leaving £2,000 that does not belong to them in your account, which will now be recalled later when an investigation is completed. Do you understand that process? So be careful. There are so many ways uh, scammers are looking at your vulnerability, they're looking at if you don't have two uh, two factor authentication on your WhatsApp. Once they have cloned your number or have access to your number, all the people in your contact data uh, data are now at risk. You have exposed all your friends, your family, at risk by you not authenticating. I mean, adding two FA to your WhatsApp. 
don't click the link, don't fish the fish. These are the things we are trying to teach our people. But a lot of people understand, but some people still do not understand. So please, please, please keep, you know, joining these calls. We are going to have different sessions, uh, you know, the example I've given you, we have so many examples to share with you. We will invite you to some informative, uh, informative sessions where you can learn and keep yourself safe. So thank you for being with us this evening and hope to see you next week, Thursday. Okay. Thank you. Just a quick thank one. You. Thank you to me on Sunday. Thank you, see you. <laughs> thank yeah, you. sorry, let me, I have just uh, um, one thing to ask, please. Okay. Yeah, I, I've been struggling to assess the material, you know, from the beginning. I don't know what went wrong um, uh, from the registration, you know. Uh, up to now, I've not um, managed to have access to where that material, I can get that material. Mr. Mr. Ido, which material? Oh, the one in the the one that you signed up. Yes, you know the reading material, the the, the thing that uh, the who is teaching. I can't, I can't have access to where to get it to read. Uh, yeah, it, the portal. It should be there now. If you will, if you log <laughs> in and go to your profile, under uh -huh. your, where you have your name or your picture or something on the right hand side. Mm -hmm. My my course or something. Click on it. If you should be able to, if you are actually uh enrolled the course you yeah i was i was that the very first day i was but you know the um, we tried to access that um material that day and the timmy said maybe something went wrong that she's going to look into are it you, again for the second uh, class it? i missed the second class of the gen this january i didn't join last uh, one can you share your screen now Okay. I own the system. Okay. Good evening, Mr. Sonny. I had the same issue. So when I asked the IC, ISC to support, they gave me the steps to assess um, the course. You need to go to benefits and add it, the course. Hmm? You need to add the course. I've listed the steps on the charts for you. Okay. Okay, I think that's fine. Thank you very much for that. So do you want to uh, copy that step-by-step uh, -step process and try it on your own? Let us know if that works so that we can share with others. It has worked for me. I can access the course now. Thank you. Fantastic. So if anybody else is having that issue, can you copy that step-by-step -step process, please? And Be on the chat now. Yes, on no on this um Zoom chat. Sorry. Oh, this Zoom chat. Okay. Yes. Um, when yeah. you log into your account, you go to get started. They click on candidates benefits. Then okay. you the course and you add it. Okay. Let me copy it first. Okay, so we're not going to be able to wait on the call for you to do that. Well, fingers crossed it will work for you. Let's, let us know how it goes, okay? Is that okay? Because we really have to go. Uh, it's past 9 p.m. That's okay. I will, I, will, I will figure it out. Yeah, that's okay. Right. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, bye. Okay, enjoy. Bye-bye. Bye, Ma. Thank you, to you. Thank you everyone. Yeah.